following message is transmitted. Hello, Multiverse, and welcome back to another episode of the Order of Chaos podcast. My name is Sanre, and I'm your host, a professional tarot reader, chaos magician, and psychonaut. And joining me today is Hagen von Tullian. Hagen is a fellow chaos magician and an educator, and I had the pleasure this past weekend of attending his Chaos Magic Essentials webinar, which was spectacular. Uh, Hagen, good to see you, and it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Hey, nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. It's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here on your show. Thank you. Let's have a good time. <laughs> yeah, so uh, full disclosure to the audience, we actually did this once already, and I uh, forgot to hit record. So <laughs> this is round two <laughs> for Hagen and I, and uh, it's we're just going to jump right into some uh, like more meaningful questions than I think we did in our, our last interaction. Um, because you know that was cool, but let's just let's get right into the, some of the meat of it for chaos magic because I think that's what's really interesting. Yes. So just right out of the gate, I want to ask you in your own words, what is chaos magic? What is chaos magic? That's that's a really nice question. Uh, I'm always a little bit uh, careful when something is termed uh with the, with the word is because is is very restrictive and it's always a little bit a little bit limiting uh because you know when i'm saying uh, when somebody is saying i am a doctor for example when you ask when you meet something yeah what are you doing and he said i'm a doctor and yeah this person is more than a doctor yeah it's, it's one one part of his life and so I'm always a little bit uh, hesitating uh, when questions are, con are coming, which are asking uh, for, a, yeah, for, for a definition when it comes with, 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 with the term is and being. And uh, maybe it comes from, from, my, from my studies and from my contact with Robert Anton Wilson. He, he really wrote an, uh, a complete book about uh, this theme. It's called... Uh, Quantum, quantum psychology, I, I think it was called. And there he uh, took some ideas where he was uh, saying, yeah, completely ban every every uh, term of, of being and is out of your life and of, out of your speech and out of your thinking. And then you will have much more greater and much more uh, liberated uh, kind of worldview because you are not uh, restricting yourself uh, with with terms like this is like this yeah it may it seems like this at this moment when i'm looking is at this or when i'm when i'm handling this but it's it's not always it is not always like this it's it seems like this so th therefore i had a little bit my hesitations when it's coming to describe uh, to answer a question like what is chaos magic but uh let's 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 have a look uh what do we see in chaos magic? Chaos magic uh, looks like a very, very practical way. It's uh, very looks like a very undogmatic way, like a very, uh, a very liberated kind of approach uh, to magic. Because this also results from from the from the history, from the from the historical climate where chaos magic emerged. It was. Uh, around the end of the 70s it was the punk era in, in great britain where it first emerged it was a kind of uh, diy mythology um, uh, mythology because people yeah do it yourself and uh, don't listen to any authorities also some uh, yeah some statements from from uh, from from Leary are still echoing in the chaos thing. Uh, question authority, think for yourself, think for yourself and question authority. And this was always, this was a climate where, where chaos magic emerged out of, out of uh, more restricted and dogmatic forms. So chaos magic is always looking for 
liberated approaches and liberated views and liberated uh, liberated methods how to uh, uh, how to approach uh, the magical side of things so it's a very practical approach and a very uh, you could say it's it looks like a very uh, practical approach and a very pragmatic approach a very practical approach and uh, yeah, it's it's free of of unnecessary and superfluous uh, bullshit. How to say? Yeah, I agree. And and everything you just said really was, you know, an eloquent way of of putting something that Peter J. Carroll said in Libra Null, which is that you know nothing is true, everything is permitted, and that is such a hard concept for some people to wrap their minds around. And I think that that's why sometimes people have this idea of chaos magic that it's you know, something that we all just make up, which is true. We do kind of just make it up, but there's so much more to it than that because, you know, the ability to make something up and then to use it as a tool to alter your reality is a whole different ball game than just making stuff up, right? It's, to me, chaos magic has, it's very akin to Zen Buddhism in its ineffability. You know what it's very hard to define what it is um but it is something and, and it is something worthwhile and something um useful that can really change your perspective so and this is what i you know just in my mind i'll i'll sit in my chair and meditate and ponder some of these questions like what are these things and i know that whatever constructs I come up with to describe them. And I try to make them as, as accessible to people as I can. I know that they're, they're a, a permission that I'm giving myself to understand something that's not understandable. Is that, yeah, you get yeah, what I'm can, saying? It, it's, yeah, you have to you. form your own construct and say, okay, this is what I believe. And that's what, you know, is something that I want to get into that's fascinating about chaos magic and why I'm attracted to it is it is the alt is the art in many ways it's the art of altering your own beliefs and then that leads me to my next question for you which is what what are beliefs and what role do you do you see them playing in chaos magic because if you're out there and you're listening to this and you're a chaos magician you've probably read Libra Null and if you Definitely. haven't I suggest you do and and we you know we realize this important role that beliefs and and the ability to change your beliefs has in chaos magic. So my next question then is is what is that? What does it mean to you? And how is that mechanism working for us within this thing that we call chaos magic? Yeah, yeah that's uh, that's really an important point because really from the beginning in chaos magic uh, we found out that uh, belief is just a tool. It's not an end in itself, and it's. Therefore, you have uh, in chaos and magic we we have the, the meta meta belief that yeah the meta belief that belief can be used as a tool for achieving effects in the world or for creating and shaping and forming your own reality. It's not a fixed thing. It's uh, really really uh, to distinguish belief from these more radical forms or more. Uh, dogmatic forms of belief which we know as faith for example religious faith and religious faith can't be questioned and it's just there it's postulated there and you can't question it and uh, but belief in itself it's a kind of belief it's a kind of your own reality tunnel somehow it's how you see your world it's it's your 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 map of the territory somehow your belief systems, your belief tunnels. And uh, in chaos magic, it was from the beginning, it was very clear that uh, as a magician, we want to change our, our worldview, our point of view, our reality tunnel as we like it and as we see fit and as we see it more comfortable and more uh, benign for us and that we are able to change it and uh, to switch not only to change but to, to switch between uh, several reality tunnels and to see belief only as a tool that uh, how that we can use to achieve effects for ourselves and for others and for the world in the end it seems to me and this is so interesting because you can't you can't experience being another person that's one of the most interesting things about being a human being is you only have your own perspective 
right? As much as you may believe that other people see and hear what you see and hear, you can't know it for sure, right? So it's it's very interesting to me how many people are out there who who can't discern between an opinion and a belief or an opinion and a fact and and how or a belief and a thought right they're all kind of in the same murky waters to most people don't really in their own minds try to make distinctions between these things but when you make those distinctions your whole view of reality starts to change and i think that that's what's so cool about chaos magic is that you're working with within if you're working with altering your beliefs, you're working within the very baseline structure of, of what creates your experience of reality. And we you know with, and this is just me as a chaos magician, you know, having some why, you know, this is why I think chaos magic is the best. <laughs> um, but you know, these other uh, witchcraft systems and religious systems are kind of prepackaged views of reality, which can be very, very useful if it's a good system. But to, so to me, I guess to answer my own question about what chaos magic is, it's it's working with the underlying flow of energy from which all of these other systems emerge. Yeah, and in chaos magic, we don't want to uh, condemn these other belief systems. We we want uh, to be aware that they are belief systems and that we are able to switch between them. And we don't want to condemn all these and say, no, no, these are only beliefs and we don't want to have anything to do with these. No, 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 on the contrary. Uh, chaos magic magicians delve deeply into other belief systems like witchcraft or uh, like myself in the, in the very complex voodoo Gnostic system, for example. And it's, uh, it's uh, and it's really a joy to and a pleasure to 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 immerse oneself in into this belief system. But always be aware that this is a special belief system. This is not an absolute truth, and this is not my faith where I construct my whole life around. It's just a, a very. Uh, it could be a very uh, pleasurable uh, and very joyful experience to to immerse oneself in such a belief system. But always have in mind, it's it's a belief system and it could be altered in any way that you want and you could change it as you want. And it's your choice that you are using this kind of belief system. And yeah, and that's, that's really results in, in a great freedom for, for the person who is aware, who has this kind of awareness. It, it is a great freedom. Not only is it a great freedom, it's a great joy. It's um really helped me to shape my sense of and this is interesting because it's almost paradoxical um my sense of self through not having to define myself through one particular belief system which i i had done in the past in the past i had said i am a levian atheistic satanist or in the past i have said i am a strictly a hermeticist and this is sort of the evolution of my path and i feel as though i when i landed on chaos magic that was where i'm going to stay forever because this is these are the waters i want to swim in where you can really dive deep into a belief system and understand that it is a belief system it's like learning another language it's a beautiful joyful experience and some of these belief systems are are spectacular at accomplishing something very specific you know and so this is this is interesting i want to know if you experience this as well because i've i've uh, griped to some of my other occultist friends about this in the past sometimes as a chaos magician sometimes i do look at some of my friends who are dedicated to one particular path let's say like norse paganism or uh, thalema and i think it must be so comforting to be able to stick to one to really say like i have a religious practice and this is what i believe and and to experience that connection to those particular uh symbols in such a deep way because i do feel that as chaos magicians we're a little bit detached kind of like the hanged man card in the tarot we're just a little bit detached from these different languages as we're learning them i mean that's been my experience what, what's yours been yeah it's it's not really necessary to to be all the time totally detached uh, you can as i said before you could really immerse yourself into a system and uh, that's really also a kind of practice that uh, was all the time around in chaos magic. Uh, uh, for example, in, you mentioned Liva Null, there is also a technique described, uh, uh, yeah, attribute uh, six different kind of belief systems to, to a die and then throw the die and then uh, live totally and completely this belief system that, it was, that is coming up. 
and not only for a week or so and we, even in extreme forms you could do this for years and mm -hmm. in years uh, it's not easy to to be uh, completely detached and it's also not necessary because you really want to experience this kind of belief system in totality and to get everything out of it what what you could get uh, out of it and uh, okay maybe you are you should be a little bit detached in the back of your mind you should always know okay this i could go as deep as i want into this into this uh, shoes and belief system but in the end uh, i always have the freedom to get out of it and i'm not trapped into it and this is really important you don't have to feel uh, trapped and uh, that you are not able to get out but on the other hand, there's nowhere why you should not go totally deeply into uh, this kind of belief system and to live it uh, as deeply as you can and to get everything out of it for yourself and as, and as long as you want. I've never been able to, discuss, I mean, aside from the time when I lived and, you know, acted as, uh, like I said, a Levian atheistic Satanist when I was a kid uh, many years ago. I was able to dedicate myself to one practice, but now I find it incredibly difficult to uh, to stick to one thing and not and not, uh, you know, and maybe this is just a fine way of doing it. I'm, I'm a pretty ADHD person, but, you know, I'll spend a day reading about the runes and, and the Norse myths and really immersing myself in that uh, mythology and that magical practice. But then later on in the day, I want to, you know, listen to the Emerald Tablets and and uh, read or read about the Sumerian deities. It's just I'm, I'm so all over the place. But I do find, and what what is what is fun for me is connecting the dots between these cultures. And again, it leads me to the conclusion that there is an underlying current of energy from which every religion um, kind of springs from. And that's that's a pretty theosophical viewpoint, I'd say. But I think that it it goes hand in hand with chaos magic. But that's just my opinion. And that, again, this is a great segue into my next question for you, which is, do you think that there are any fundamental truths? Uh, spontaneously, I would say no. Could you, could you give me an example of a fundamental truth? I don't know. Okay, well, I will give you my example, but I want to say for the purpose of this conversation, anyone listening, I am a chaos magician, but I am also a hermeticist because I find these views to be compatible. So for me, the fundamental truths are the hermetic principles, the principle of vibration, rhythm, polarity, uh, mentalism, and you know, so on and so forth. So those I, I believe are fundamental truths, but I get into debates with my friends about this. I'm not, I'm not trying to tell you that's the truth. That's again, like as a chaos magician, I can say this is the belief structure that I've chosen to believe in most wholeheartedly as, as fundamental truths that operate in all spiritual practices. So do, do you think that there are such fundamental truths? I don't think so, as I said before. Uh, in the beginning, uh, especially when you, when, you are entering the, when you were entering the IoT, there was in the beginning during the first initiation, uh, are you aware that there may be no absolute truths mm -hmm. and you could only get initiated when you answer this question uh, with yes, of course. Yeah. And so this is quite an important part, especially in chaos magic. Maybe there are no absolute truths. There are, uh, there may be some truths, some helpful truths for some, uh, for some, some part of your own way, maybe. But in the end, really absolute truths. I don't know. The only thing that we are, sure, I can say, we are, we are pretty sure that uh, at one point we all gonna gonna die. I don't know it's, it's a, if it is a fundamental truth. I don't know exactly. Uh, but it's, it's, it's one of the things which, which is very, very probably quite sure. On the other hand, uh, why we have uh, all these tales and myths and stories around, uh, going around for a long times about immortality and uh, people who are living for hundreds of years and Methuselah, for example, is very old and uh, the undying vampires and uh, these, are, these are stories that's, that's are going around and uh, is it just fantasy or is there maybe a piece of truth also inside of it? And we don't know. We don't know for sure uh, at the moment. No, we don't. It's... Um... 
Are you, have you heard of the idea of what they call quantum immortality? Nope. So, and this is interesting because I, I, it's so funny to sort of think of these things for yourself and then find out that, oh, this is out there. This is already a theory that exists in science. But, you know, theoretically, let's say the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics is accurate and there are infinite parallel worlds with infinite parallel versions of you and I. And let's say that consciousness is steering itself through those many worlds and many possibilities. And that's kind of the underlying, you know, mechanism of quantum physics and consciousness and how we experience time and space. So if there are truly infinite possibilities, then one of the outcomes of what in one of those worlds is that you live forever because every possibility is on the table here. That's what they're saying. So in at least one of those worlds, you live forever. So is it conceivable then that your consciousness inevitably ends in that one world? Maybe, and, and again, I'm just like throwing ideas out there because it's fun, mm -hmm. but maybe no one ever experiences their own demise. Maybe you only experience the demise of everyone around you. And eventually you end up in the timeline where you were the sole survivor of the universe. Yeah, yeah, or maybe yeah. that happens for everybody, and that's just the nature of reality that we're fully unaware of. Yeah, but uh, one thing which is for sure, we only will know it hopefully when it's happened. Yeah, yeah, and that yeah, that's one of the great mysteries, and that's you know again why I find chaos magic to be so useful because it seems to me just from a logical standpoint, right? If and, and this isn't a religious point of view, because I think a religious person will argue, I do know, but I'm going to say we don't know what happens after we die. And we don't have direct access to the metaphysical realm in the way that a lot of us would like to, especially as occultists. We want to be able to just open the door and say, there it is, and, you know, talk to the entities that are there, which is what we do through ritual. But, you know, <laughs> how great would it be if you could just literally open a door and there it is. But we can't do that. It's a non-physical aspect of reality. So in order to have any sense of it, you have to make up in your head some framework for interaction with it that works for you. But you have to know that that's what it is, that it's a framework that either you've created or you've adopted through a religious system. It's, it's, it's a pathway to, to describe something that's otherwise indescribable. Definitely. Okay, so Hagen, my next question for you just to go off in a different direction here, because you've been doing this uh, for so much longer than I have. Um, I, I've only been on the path with chaos magic for about three years. And before that, I was practicing other forms of ritual magic. But how has chaos magic evolved since you began your practice? So chaos magic. Uh, yeah, I've I've been around with chaos, chaos magic for quite some time now. I came into contact with, with chaos magic. Let me think about it. I think it was in the 80s when I found a copy of the German translation of Lieber Null and it immediately fascinated me a lot. And uh, in the beginning, chaos magic was quite uh, an outsider uh, this, uh, point of view for, for the more traditional and uh, established uh, magical traditions and practitioners. Chaos magicians were, uh, were very often regarded like, oh, these are very dark and black magicians, outsider freaks, and only interested in, in, in quick results and getting late and stuff like this. And uh, they are not respectful and it's not effective what they are doing because they are not rooted in they are not rooted in a in a tradition and in a succession line and all these things and so in the beginning uh, a lot of 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 traditional magicians didn't accept it uh, the chaos magical approach but uh, then it, it really changed a lot afterwards and it became more and more popular more and more authors came along and writing books about it and when i'm looking now around i think chaos magic is quite all over and even if uh, when people are not saying now nah, i'm a chaos magician but they are using a lot of the stuff that that evolved out of the chaos current sigil magic for example it's it's totally well known and everybody it doesn't matter if you are in, in a in a member of of, of a witchcraft tradition or something else you are, you know how to create sigils and they, they are using this and also, some some other approaches of chaos magic are totally uh, totally normal and and 
and uh, are still around. Maybe there are not so many people who claim themselves chaos mag magicians, but a lot of uh, traditions and people, they are using all these, uh, these techniques and so all these approaches that chaos magic developed and came up with. I, can, I agree completely. In fact, and I've had this conversation with a few friends and uh, who are also chaos magicians and, and okay, maybe we're biased, but you know, for one thing, I still notice that attitude uh, towards chaos magic occasionally from, you know, uh, other traditions and okay, may, either, you know, assuming that chaos magic is a left hand path practice. And again, I have nothing against the left. Most of my friends are left hand path practitioners. And for all intents and purposes, I am a left hand path practitioner, but I anchor myself to hermeticism and I just see it as being slightly different. Anyways, I digress. I still see this attitude towards chaos magic like it's either ineffective or not real magic because it's not rooted in some particular tradition, as you're saying. But here's my argument and an argument my friends have made as well. Something I see online in forums is chaos magic is not real because it's all based on unverifiable personal gnosis. Okay, but all traditions, <laughs> all of these ancient traditions are based on unverifiable personal gnosis. It's just that that gnosis happened a long time ago. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, until you show me the skeleton of an angel, like in The Simpsons, you know, it's unverifiable personal gnosis. We, all of these traditions come from these incredible stories and these incredible experiences. And, and again, I'm not saying that these things didn't happen. I'm saying they did. I'm saying these people had these incredible experiences that they're describing in these religious texts, but the people to this day are still having these experiences and receiving information from the chaos realm or from the other side or the spirit world, whatever you want to call it, and that these lessons are still coming through, right? And so these different systems of magic and, and religion are coming from one unified sort of source. And, and I do believe that as chaos magicians, we're tapping directly into or as close as you can get to that source. Uh, and so for that reason, I think that it's especially effective that it is, you know, and, and this has certainly been my experience that sigil magic is the most potent type of magic I've ever messed with. It's, uh, well, I've tried lots of different things, right? I've done uh, workings with spirits. I've been, you know, doing tarot magic for many years. Um, I've messed with runes and even when i was a kid uh voodoo and traditional uh levian ritual satanic magic has also been very effective for me and i find that that's because probably because it's very close to chaos magic but nothing works as well as sigils nothing and that's to me again sort of the quintessential method of a chaos magician is the sigil it's one of the first things we all learn it's one of the first things presented in libra null um, but i i find it to be highly potent and very effective magic and, and I definitely want to um, do what I can to proliferate this information. The mm. chaos magic is, is highly effective. And, and even if it's not based on some um, specific tradition, it's based on the underlying current of energy that from which those traditions sprung. Yeah, and especially in sigil magic, you, you need nothing but your own self to do it. You don't need to believe in, as you just described it, you don't uh, need to believe in spirits, in gods, and or in, in, a, in another complicated belief system somehow. It's, it's totally unnecessary. All you need is maybe it's, it's, a, it's a pen and a pen and a piece of paper and your own self and nothing else. The and pen is country. mightier than the sword. Whoever said that, maybe they were a practitioner of magic and not necessarily even sigil magic, but even if you aren't going to sigilize, even if you write down your intentions, just the act of writing them down helps manifest them, in my opinion. And a good example of that, and you're probably aware of uh, Grant Morrison, the, uh, the artist, and his, you know, turning an entire comic book into a sigil. I mean, that's brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, the, the hyper sigil of the, the invisibles. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's really, yeah, it really impressed me a lot. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's definitely you are you are definitely right. Yeah, I can co completely agree with you. Yeah, um, and I, and I think that it's, you know, maybe this is the beginning of our tradition. Maybe I'm, I'm not sure. Do we even do? I mean, not that, that I'm speaking for a group here. I'm speaking for myself. But you know, chaos magic. It is something, and, and it's been around since the 70s, like you were saying. You know, it, it is at the beginning of maybe becoming its own tradition. And that's sort of the, one of the interesting underlying questions is, 
is the belief that belief is a tool, a belief system in itself? And I would say, yes, it is. So yeah. what is what is that belief? That belief itself is it's like a master tool. It's like an omni tool. Yeah, it's a master tool. It's a it's a it's a meta tool somehow. It's a, it's a tool above the other tools. Yeah, and uh, but yeah, it's not an end in itself, as I said. And uh, I just wanted to come back to to a point that you just mentioned before uh, about the intention. Uh, I just made it clear in, in my webinar in, uh, that you mentioned in the beginning, uh, intention uh, and, and the proper formulation of your own intent, it's the most important part in nearly every, every approach to magic in my, uh, what I, in my belief and what I'm thinking. And uh, that's why, why sigil magic is, is so very potent and, uh, and uh, uh, so successful because it's, it's always uh, the first step in every, in every direction is that you have to really uh, clarify your own intention and make it totally clear and totally precise and in a positive way. And I also mentioned in my webinar the stories that uh, sometimes it really happened to me and to others that uh, things were really happening even before I made a sigil or another kind of spell out of my uh, precisely formulated intention. I just wrote my intent down in the way that I that I really wanted and uh, in the in, in a very appropriate way. And then I put my piece of paper with all these intentions by side and waiting for another time to put this into practice with a sigil, with another kind of spell, or with a kind of evocation for this with, with one of my servitors or or some invocational work. And it just rested there with some other intents. And then maybe I I I had forgotten it because I had so many other things to do and when I put, put, uh, took my paper my, my papers in my hand and looked through my to my to my list and my intents and my my to do things my magical to do list and I found oh I formulated this uh, this my intention very precisely and in the meantime it already happened so I, I, I didn't do anything else magically and so uh, I can always uh, really stress the point that that the, the the clear and precise formulation of your intent, it's, it's very the most important step in any in every practical magic. And all the other things that happened later on, if spell work and working with spirits and gods and so, these are just uh, very nice and, and very potent and effective ways to, to support your intentions. But basically, they're not really necessary. I absolutely agree. I think that that's um, definitely it's got to be the quintessential kernel of, of what makes magic work is setting your intention. And, and this can even be, you know, there's, there's a difference between setting your intention and praying, right? You can pray for something, but it's not, it's not the same as setting your intention and saying, this is what I intend to happen. But there's a, there's a similarity there in that you're forming the connection with the universe and saying, this is what I want. Mm -hmm. And it's no. that, it's it's that initial spark of formulating your desire that at least gets the manifestation process happening in the first place. And I think that, that a lot of people who are just going through day to day life actually really struggle with saying, I want this or I want that. And then having it, you know, really be in line with things that are good for them and and, and will progress their lives forward. I mean, like I could sit here all day and say, I want a Ferrari, but it's not going to just manifest. Right. Um, but when you set your intentions on things that are achievable and you know, no matter, I'm not saying set the bar low, I'm saying set the bar very high, but things that are real, right? You can't, I always tell my friends when doing magic, like you can't manifest things that are completely, you can't, you're not going to manifest a dragon. <laughs> no matter how yeah. badly you want a dragon, you're not going to manifest a dragon, right? So set your intentions on things that are real and achievable. And once you lock your mind into it, that you're going to do this, that this is your intention, the manifestation process begins right then and there. And just like you said, everything you do on top of that, magically is just icing on top of the cake it's support systems to move your manifestation along faster but it's that initial process of, of setting the intention that gets the ball moving or gets the universe and you working in a relationship and rather than a the normal state of being i would say the magical state of consciousness is in a con continuous connective relationship with the universe whereas the non-magical state of consciousness the left-brained is constantly responding to physical reality. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, probability, that uh, was a really nice point. Yeah? 
uh, and really important point. Uh, a lot of, of chaos magicians are saying when you are doing magic, first do everything which is uh, necessary and possible for you on the normal, on, on the usual worldly level. And then as an extra, throw some magic in it, you know? And this yes. is also a very important uh, chaos magic approach. Not just sitting there uh, in your basement and doing some some sigil and waiting for things happened, yeah. And uh, yeah, you, then you must maybe you must really distort probability in a in a huge way. But if you are doing everything uh, which is which is possible for you on the on the on the worldly plane, and then on top of it giving it some some more magic, then the probability. Uh, it's really high that you, you that you could achieve something. And the other thing you also mentioned it very rightly. You should be aware about what is probably and uh, and what not, and what you could achieve very easily and what not. As you said, yeah, manifesting a dragon. Yeah, okay, you could do a spell work for this, and maybe you come across a magazine with, with a lot of nicely illustrated dragons, but you never you would never come across a real dragon. Yeah, with with uh, who is sending fire out of his mouth and something like this that you can really touch and get burned by it by the fire and so like this yeah you came with some coincidences or synchronicities you can you may come across some some depictions of dragons or something like this or mm -hmm. dreams of dragons and i don't know yeah but and this is also a very important point for for a magician especially for a chaos magician to be aware what is achievable uh, what is what is probably and how in, in which way you could really distort uh, probability to which amount and uh, with which kind of magic uh, you could really achieve even more uh, probability distortion and uh, this is also a very interesting point yeah, it is. And I have found through my practice, and this is why I'm such a huge advocate of magic in the first place and why I you know, have a business based around magic in this podcast, is that magic works. It really does work. You can distort probabilities, you can make things happen that probably otherwise would not have happened. But you do have to do things in the physical world too. And to go back to what you had just said, so here's what I notice. And this, this could be unique to me, I doubt it is, but I think it's a little different for everybody. But when I do a, a sigil, when I create a sigil or when I make a spell or when I make an agreement with a spirit, one of the things I'm always looking out for immediately afterwards is inspiration to act. Because I find that often when you perform magic, one of the initial results is that you will feel inspired to act in the ways that will achieve your manifestation when you may not have felt that inspiration had you not done the magical operation. So if you make a sigil that says, you know, I'm going to get a, you know, I, I have a great new job because we always want to phrase our sigils in the present tense. Like if you're trying to get a new job, you're going to create a sigil that says, I have a great new job with all these benefits something like that, right? And then what you're immediately going to look out for is that inner signal that tells you to act, what place to apply to, how you're going to perform in your interview. It's those little things, right? The magic doesn't just drop the job on you and like, oh my God, I got it miraculously, but it may alter your inner system to the point where you're like, whoa, I didn't know I could do these things. And then suddenly you've accomplished something that you didn't think you could accomplish before. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, it's not only that you are uh, doing everything in the in the normal world before you do the spell. It's even afterwards, just as you described. Yeah, uh, your spell work really inspire you to to find the the, the right approaches. And uh, definitely, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's not just just like sitting around and waiting for the universe to 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 give it to you somehow. Yeah, and just waiting there. Yeah, I've I've done my spell work. I've 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 done my invocation, and now I'm waiting for the universe to provide it to me. No, no, it's not such easy thing. Yeah. <laughs> no, but but that feeling of magical inspiration is in itself so wonderful and magical. And you're you're if you take that bravery that moment to act on it because you know when you have that feeling to act and, and this, we all some of us like me i'm a double leo and i jump on everything right i act on everything um but some people are very hesitant and you got to know when to act and when not to um in the very first episode of this podcast i spoke with um travis mchenry who is the creator of this tarot deck here um, <clears throat> the the occult tarot uh -huh. and this is a tarot deck that is based on the goetia and it has 78 cards and 72 of them 
our goetic spirits the exactly the goetic spirits from the book mm. goetia okay so he was describing to me working with the spirits of the goetia and i believe it was a lucifuge reficile that he was working with and he said that when he worked with this goetic spirit it's not that this and this was uh, to gain success and money it's not that money started coming to him it's that he started suddenly became very interested in business and in financial workings and through this invocation of lucifer's reficile he gained an interest in the workings of finance and became more financially successful as a result and that that to me is exactly how magic really works and manifests in the real world it's not it's not the, the you know the silly stuff that people who are uninvolved in the practice may think it in. It, it's not Harry Potter, you know, but it is real and it really does work and it can really change your life. Definitely, definitely. That's interesting that you are mentioning this example and it reminded me of uh, of a work a working that I've uh, offered to 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 some people of my group last year online when we. We're not able to to meet in person because of the, the pandemic situation. So we switched to 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 some online workings, and so I presented to to some people who were interested in the theme uh, a kind of magical, a very long magical working uh, with this with a theme of wealth magic, prosperity magic, and this was not only one spell. This, this took uh, several months uh, that we worked on it with all these five basic disciplines. At first, we, we used. Uh, Uh, illuminatory techniques to to clarify our views about wealth and prosperity and what we want to achieve and in which way and uh, uh, what is our wealth per persona persona and all these kinds of things and then we moved on to uh, to divination to find uh, information about how we could uh, bring into reality our ideas and uh, that we found in in the illum illuminatory um, in the illuminating uh, period. And, and so on. We moved to all the, the basic disciplines uh, with evocation and invocation and, 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 and enchantment. Yeah? And using all these different kinds of, of, thing to, uh, of techniques and methods, all concentrated and focused on the, on the overall theme of wealth, magic and prosperity. And it was really successful for, for many of the participants. Uh, one of them, he, he really totally changed his life, his, his, his working life and created a new business and a new career. And others told me about uh, uh, great successes they had. And that was really an, a very interesting thing. And it's not just uh, like we said before, it's not like one, one spell and then waiting for the things happening. It was really a quite complex process and a long process that was involved in this. Yeah, and, and magical work can be a long process and it can, you know, it. The great thing about it, though, is, is doing that kind of work and seeing the results. And I really enjoy doing group workings with my friends where we're all working on a different aspect of some magical process and we get a group manifestation. It's it's so much fun and it's it <clears throat> it provides, you know, reflection and verification because sometimes you'll do a spell and it'll work and you can tell people and they'll be like, okay, yeah, sure. You know, nobody believes you because they didn't experience the results with you. But when you do these group workings and and many people in the group have great success at that point, it's like, okay, so now what, what do you, what's your rebuttal to this at this point, right? We've done this magical working. It's paid off for this many people in the group, or we all saw the same manifestation, um, you know, or, or if you're, and this isn't something I'm able to do yet, but something I'm working very hard on is if you're able to enter the dream space with a group of people and experience the same lucid dream together, you know, or if you want to call it astral travel or, you, you know, uh, mm -hmm. fourth dimensional gatherings, <laughs> yeah. that's something I'm very, I'm very um, focused on, on getting myself to that level of ability. What about the future of chaos magic? It's interesting because uh, when I was younger, I saw the, the magical uh, um, area, the magical scene was very clear, dominated by only a few things. For example, Thelema was around, uh, Alistair Crowley and Thelema, because it was just published before in the 70s and in the 80s and so, and especially in Germany, a lot of translations into German were available. So 
Uh, Selema, was, Selema was, uh, was a very big thing there. Also Wicca was very, very new and very prominent and was going around. And then you had some, some also, especially in, in Germany, uh, it was more a local scene in these days because it was before the internet, we don't had access to anything and also information was quite restricted mostly to, to, to the German book market and to, to publications which, are, which were in German. So it was very, very, uh, yeah, it was very, yeah, very clear what's, what was happening. In Germany, we had also these more traditional ways which came Came from these uh, German magicians who uh, mostly published through the Fraternita Saturni. This was very prominent in Germany. I don't know what what other things were in other kind of countries very prominent also besides Thelema and and Wicca. And uh, so chaos magic was a really a, a brand new thing in these times and something new that's like a movement. But uh, since then, I don't know if there is another a great magical movement going on. I can see that people are uh, immersing themselves in, in several different parts. Some people are exploring, for example, traditional witchcraft, which is very, very uh, important at the moment. The Grimoire traditions had a great revival since several years. People are going very deep into this all this Grimoire stuff, which was not very prominent, for example, in the 80s. Yeah, it, uh, it was not so very uh, popular like nowadays. And uh, people are exploring, for example, all these uh, uh, voodoo stuff, uh, Makumba stuff, Kimbanda things, uh, the uh, Santissima Muerte cults. And so it's, it's a quite a, a huge variety of, of magical interests around at the moment. But uh, uh, chaos magic is also still there, and uh, uh, but I don't see uh, such such a huge movement in a magical movement uh, rising up in the magical scene. Or uh, or have I do I have a blind spot somehow? What do you think? It's so interesting. I was just having this conversation with a friend earlier today, who's a, <clears throat> actually my astrology teacher. So, a I do think that there is a magical movement happening now, mm -hmm. but I, cause I do think that, that this thing that's been coined the great awakening, I think it really is happening. I think people are waking up spiritually. I think that the magic is taking sort of a, like a, a back of the bus, you know, uh, you know, it, it's in the shadow of the new age movement. I think that the new age movement is very, very popular and it's introducing a, a large group of people to metaphysics in general. And then through that, because I think that there's a lot of, you know, politics infused with the new age movement and, and a lot of, um, you know, I, I'm not a love and light person, personally. I, I'm, you know, I, I'm, my purpose, my mission in life is to spread esoteric sort of practices and philosophies because I find that they're very beneficial to your ability to manage your own mental well-being. Um, and I, I feel like with certain other movements that are going on right now, they're, they're preaching some stuff that's great, some stuff that's not great. But my point is, I think a lot of people are waking up to the reality of metaphysics, but it takes a lot of working through some of the BS before you have the realization that, okay, like a magical practice, this is getting to the root of it. And you know what, I, I don't, I'm not trying to offend anybody, right? This has just been my experience and my, my viewpoint. I think that chaos magic in particular has a real future because as I've said so many times now, I believe, I believe, this is my belief, that what chaos magic is, is working with the underlying current from which all these spiritual practices sort of arise and are languages of. I think we're getting to the source code of what we call physical reality when we work within chaos magic. And because I think, because of the internet and because the the ability we have now to compare cultures and, and, and say like, wow, look at all these similarities. Look at these, you can start to paint the picture of the underlying metaphysical truth and to work within that truth truth right however you want to i know that these are subjective words but i'm trying to be as descriptive as i can i do feel that chaos magic has a future like a real future and that it, it's going to sort of become a big deal because people are going to learn to work with this flow of energy without having to label it 
or say you're doing it wrong or you're doing it right. It, it becomes, you know, I would love to see a world where if there's 8 billion people in the world, we should have 8 billion religions. Everyone has their own personal religion and relationship to divinity or to chaos or to, to, you know, whatever God they choose, whatever it just, but like, it's good for us to recognize that it's a personal relationship and not a dogmatic, this is the way it is. Right. And to focus on that relationship so from a spiritual view, because I believe, again, this is just my beliefs, but I believe that you can't be mentally healthy if you're spiritually unwell. I, I think that, uh, you know, a strict nothing matters, the world is just, or the universe is like random. If you believe that, it's really damaging to your, your mental health and your spirit and your, your ability to have a positive outlook on life. So I want people to develop this relationship, but I want them to understand that it's a personal relationship that they have with whatever they choose. And as silly as that can sound, it's a real thing that can really change how you, how you view reality. And that's what chaos magic is doing. It's changing the way people view reality. And that's part of what this great awakening is as well. It's people waking up to the, the realization that we do not live in one objective universe, all of us together. We are each at the center of our own subjective universe. And those universes are interacting with each other. And that's what I think the many worlds uh, interpretation of quantum physics really is, is how many worlds are there? Well, how many are consciousnesses are there experiencing some sense of reality? That's how many worlds there are, right? So I'm at the center of my universe and my universe contains you and you are at the center of your universe and your universe contains me. And I know that that's a difficult sort of way to, to grasp things, but that's really what's going on here because everything I experience as my reality is a creation of my own mind and same goes for you and every other individual in the world. And we're waking up to that realization now through, uh, you know, quantum physics and the advances they're making and through the internet and our ability to see through another person's eyes and through another person's perspective and realize that they really do live in like a different universe. For example, a devout Christian and, and a devout atheist live in two different realities. They do not see the universe the same way at all. Totally incompatible views, and yet their universes contain each other. Yeah, so, that's, yeah. An, yeah that's an interesting <laughs> point, yeah. yeah so uh, we could agree that there is not a, a specific magical current uh, moving up or going, uh, going around like before, but it's a more an overall rising of, of awareness or consciousness about these uh, uh, these dimensions, these realms of magic, of occultism, of spiritualism. Yeah, as, uh, in this point, I can totally agree. Yeah, it's not it's not uh, a clear cut current like before. Maybe yeah? you have Wicca, you have Thelema, you have uh, uh, Tiphonians, you have chaos magicians, or something like this. And but nowadays, yeah, that's right uh, because also we, uh, of the, the, the great. Uh, access to, to all kind of uh, information and experience you could get through the World Wide Web now. And uh, uh, people find, 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 can very easily find other associates uh, uh, through this medium very easily. Yeah? And it doesn't matter if they are doing some ayahuasca ceremonies or if they are uh, exploring the, uh, the venom of the toad or if they are using the, the power of, 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 of thought, the right, uh, right thinking and the positive thinking methods. And I don't know what else. And people who are working on, on the shift in consciousness and all those things. Uh, it's, it's yeah I, I can totally agree that uh, I have the impression that even that even more and more people nowadays are, are, are more spiritual aware are, how do you want to call it they are in their own way not not uh, guided or directed by by an institution like the church or something like this before but in their own uh, individual uh, approaches and ways and and this is really interesting yeah uh, that's that's quite interesting uh i made i'm meeting so many people who are has who are totally open to 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 magical ideas and to spiritual ideas and and all this occult stuff this was not this was not so so very usual in uh in during the 80s for example or even the 90s yeah you often came across people said oh what's that that's that's totally crap what you are doing there and often i i was not able to to talk amongst some people about these themes because i, I immediately experienced that these people are they are not at all interested in this stuff or that uh, they really resisted these kind of ideas 
And nowadays, I, 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 that's right. I, I have the impression that there's a, a greater openness uh, regarding all these these approaches and these themes. Definitely. Yeah, something is definitely happening. Something's changing. And I, I'm going to present my own theory here, okay? This is what I think is happening. Again, this is just what I think. I never intend to tell anybody, like, what is real. Because, I don't know, We're like I said, we're all each in our own subjective universe. But here's some things that, that you can read about if you want to Google this that are interesting, okay? Right now, as we speak, the Earth's magnetic poles are moving further and further, faster and faster. They're flipping. And, you know, it's speeding up. So I'm not sure where it's at right now, but it's moving, I believe, away from Russia and towards Canada, which is where I am. Um, and they're going to make a whole flip. Now, Edgar Case uh, and, and his, he was, you know, he was a, uh, a psychic um, who predicted like the rise of Atlantis. And he actually predicted the, the poles flipping and it's happening now. And if you read the Emerald Tablets of Thoth the Atlantean by, um, Dr. Doriel, who's, who's a, you know, brilliant occultist, they talk about the flipping of the poles and the flipping of the poles being the cause of the sinking of Atlantis in the first place. Anyways, long story short, they, they uh, interrelate the flipping of the poles with changes in consciousness. And what's very interesting to me is that two things that are definitively, you know, demonstrably happening in the world right now are that the poles are flipping and that there seems to be a change in consciousness happening. We, you know, I don't know if it's a coincidence or if Edgar Case was right or, or you know, if, if all this stuff is real. I don't know, but I do think it's fascinating that they're happening, coinciding. And, and also coinciding with the poles flipping with this shift in consciousness or great awakening that's happening in the world today is that we're um, coming up to, I believe, the sort of end curve point of the procession of the equinox. And this is a process that takes you know hundreds of years, but we're at that, that point, right, where we go from this way to that way. And I, I wonder if that's not like a switching point between um, sort of a more technologically like view, you know, a more technological reality to moving back in a shift in the consciousness towards more of a holistic, magical sort of view of reality. Because I do feel like we're sort of moving away from one and into another, or maybe not even away from one. I mean, there are crazy things happening in technology right now. Um, but, I, but I think that they're, that in, at least in conjunction to these things, we're seeing a huge renaissance in metaphysics. Yeah, I can only hope uh, for this, that this really happened, yeah, because when we are looking at the planet and what uh, humanity has done with the planet, all this mess, yeah, with uh, peak oil, uh, resource exhaustion, overpopulation, uh, climate change, and all these other kind of messing things up with our environment. And uh, I can only hope that such a shift in consciousness really uh, brings some, some, some betterment uh, for the human condition at the moment, because before everything is really gets messed up here now. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And, and so again, this is something that fascinates me as a mythology and as a possibility is that if you go back and look at the stories of Atlantis, you know, if you were to talk to a, uh, a tribe that's un like an uncontacted tribe that's that exists in the world today, and they were to tell you what, if they know anything about America, they would describe it the way we describe Atlantis. Like there's this far away place and they've got these crazy flying machines and the shit there is just, you wouldn't believe it, right? They've got this and that and the other thing, all these crazy technologies. And I wonder if this isn't just the cycle of earth is a, if a society rising to this level of technology coinciding with a pole flip, a shift in consciousness and a resetting of society, the story of Atlantis sinking. And, and, you know, in many of the stories of Atlantis, they, they had risen to this level of technology where they were doing things like changing the weather, which we're actually doing now and making these big mistakes. And then whoop, they went away. <laughs> and, yeah. I, and I do think that we're in a, in a place in the world where we're very much in danger of causing our own destruction. And this, this is the story that of Atlantis, they caused their own destruction through their, lust of technology and, and, and ability and power. And we're, we're reliving it right now. It's, it's yeah. so interesting. Yeah, we are living in interesting times. Yeah, we, you know, we may be the new Atlantis and we just don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? I mean, I mean, honestly, after the last few years, would you be surprised by anything? <laughs> yeah, 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 if, yeah. If aliens landed uh, tomorrow outside my front door, I'd be like, okay, yeah. 
that seems right along in line with what's been going on in the world. Yeah, but maybe they are already around here. Yeah. That's a whole nother conversation to have. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, I listen to a lot of, of uh, channels and I, I don't know what I think. Okay. I, I'm just going to say this on record. I don't know if I believe these people are really channeling aliens or if they're channeling their own higher mind or their own subconscious and that's coming through in, in an archetype. I really don't know, but I do find a lot of the information that they give to be fascinating and, and really interesting to listen to. Um, I've been fascinated with the topic of aliens since I was a kid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's quite fascinating, but uh, it's, it's so clear when we are looking now, we, uh, at the universe, how, how immen immensely large the universe is. It's, we can't imagine how, how va the immense vastness of the universe. And it's to it must be totally obvious that there is some that there must be some intelligence out there yeah? yes. in this in this huge huge very vast cosmos there must be other species or i don't know how to call it that must be intelligent even more intelligent than 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 we are Absolutely. and my 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 opinion is uh, if they are such uh, evolved if there are such evolved species around and with such high development and evolution and intelligence um, they don't come here with 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 a with a, a UFO, yeah, flying around here with a, with a piece of metal, yeah, and like we are used to do it, yeah, and landing here or, or having an accident here and ending up in Area 51 or something like this. Uh, they have other ways to travel around uh, the universe, yeah. They they could uh, handle space and time in totally different ways, and I'm pretty sure they don't need any spacecraft or anything else to to get across the universe and so maybe they are already here and uh, do you think when you want to explore the universe do you want to uh, travel with your with your own in your own flesh uh, to to some other place where you don't know what's happening there what kind of radiation is there is there anything else which support uh, your your human form in living you don't know it must it would be much more better to travel in another kind of dimension in, in your mind or i don't know yeah and then to go into uh, to some place uh, where the, and you should be able to to go into the inhabitants on another planet by mind for example because these inhabitants are totally equipped for these surroundings yeah and maybe uh, the, these aliens are doing this also in this kind of way they are already here and when people are channeling maybe they also they are just uh, the flesh suit uh, for some aliens for some time, yeah, who want to for some time for some curious interest want to explore what's going on here, and for them it's a kind of channeling. I don't know. It it really could be, and I want to say also I've had channeling experiences myself with entities that I would describe as alien. I just I I feel that there's a certain um, arrogance in claiming that you know what this, I mean, you could relay the information that's being given to you. And if, you know, for example, um, I'll mention Bashar, who's one of my, who is my favorite channel to listen to uh, also because he's hilarious for one thing, but because the information is so interesting and, and it's, you know, I'm not going to say what I believe, but if I were having the experience, and again, I've had channeling experiences and the entity that I channeled, and this is up on my Patreon for anyone who's interested, you can you know sign up to my Patreon and view the video, was the deity Enki, who's also known as Ea, uh, as a Sumerian Babylonian deity, who's always been one of my spirit guides. Still, I wonder if that experience didn't come from my own subconscious mind, but then here's the thing, okay? Even if it did, just as you were saying, okay, the doorway to out there isn't out there, it's in here. If you're gonna have communication with fourth dimensional entities or aliens or whatever you call them or gods or your spirit guides it happens in an internal way and i wonder about things like you know i've i've never gotten to visit stonehenge but i wonder if if a skilled practitioner were to go to a place like that an energetic place like that and sit in the middle of that place and sit and try to make contact if they wouldn't have a, an incredible trans, you know, transcendent experience, because these places, these ancient places, the pyramids and Stonehenge, they're they're very energetically charged. They have very strange properties, and I wonder, you know, not to go full on ancient aliens here, but I wonder if <laughs> these aren't ancient sites of, of of 
ancient technologies for tra the transference of consciousness. Because if you were going to, let's say we wanted to visit a, a civilization that's 100,000 light years away, well, you could never get there in a human body. Just like you were saying, it, it, it's just impossible. And th to think about the size of space, this is my favorite way to visualize it. All right, there are more atoms in a grain of sand than there are grains of sand on Earth. Now think about that for a moment, right? Then realize that our entire solar system looks like an atom. And it could be one atom in what we call the universe or the all, the multiverse, right? Our entire solar system, which includes our sun and all the other planets, which are hundreds of times bigger than Earth, could be but one atom of the body that we call the universe, right? It's The size is unimaginable. Even through that description, I can't I can't get across to anybody. It's unimaginable, unimaginably large. And the distances are unimaginably vast. So there would be no other way, you know, there'd be no way to get there in a metal ship. You, it would have to be through transference of consciousness. And, and I think that these things are fascinating and, you know, um, just mind boggling to think about, but, but all related to the field that, that we call metaphysics and, and all possible in there somehow. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, yeah, uh, as above, so below. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And and that phrase helps me so much when I'm thinking about these things because it, it really, you know, from a from a scientific point of view, that's the the description of a fractal, right? A fractal being one unit of a hologram that contains all the information of the entire picture, right? And we know that the universe is made out of fractal patterns. Right. So really that and that's that's one of the things that I find to be so fascinating about the Kabbalion and the Hermetic principles is it seems to be it's not ancient. Right. It was printed in 1807, but it's it's this very old. And if it's true, you know, what I believe that this is sort of a, a channeled work, uh, as, you know, that's it's presenting ancient principles. These are like an ancient treatise on quantum physics. Uh, the law of vibration. This is this is a built into mm. quantum physics. We know that all ma matter is just vibrating energy, and it says so right in the Kabbalion. <laughs> and these principles, like as above, so below, and rhythm and polarity and mentalism, gender, right? They all seem to be fundamental truths to me about the, at least the the scientific nature of the the plane of reality that we find ourselves in. I don't know about the universe or the multiverse, but at least this area of it that we're in, these seem to be the the laws of of all this. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, yeah and uh, l let us now connect uh, all this interesting things of aliens and the universe and so there's a vastness of the universe, again, back to chaos magic. Uh, chaos magic really started uh, very basically uh, with elements of magic and attributed the, the five elements, uh, earth, water, fire and air and spirit to the, the five disciplines, for example, uh, to, in, to enchantment, divination, evocation, invocation and illumination. So the, the, the basic elements. And we know, and you, I have also presented this in my webinar, uh, planetary magic. After elementary magic, planetary magic. You have the, the, the basic eight, eight archetypes, uh, which are represented by the traditional planets as we know them. Uh, and uh, so maybe the next step, uh, we talked about before the future of chaos magic, maybe the next area of exploration and the next step for chaos magic would be more into the direction of stellar magic, uh, you know, star magic, stellar magic, because we had the, we already had the, the elementals in, in, in chaos magic. Uh, we had planetary, we have planetary magic very much explored and we use it very uh, successfully. And maybe the next step could be a kind of stellar magic, uh, expanding uh, the chaos magic approach into these dimension, into these areas. This could be very interesting, maybe, as a kind of future of chaos magic. I agree. Uh, I am a student of astrology, not an astrologer. Uh, you know, I, I know a fair bit. <clears throat> but uh, the system that I use, the system that I'm being taught, is the, the ancient astrology system using the classical planets. Uh, and I find and whole, whole sign houses, and I find it to be the most accurate. Um, now, I I do follow the cycles of the moon within my own magical practice. 
as much as I can. If I need to cast a spell, I need to cast a spell. I don't necessarily wait for the new moon or the full moon or, or you know, the, exactly the right timing. But I do try to keep my practice somewhat in line with the with the moon phases. I think it's it's very it's a huge undertaking to really follow all the, all the transits of all the planets and, and to arrange your magic accordingly. But of the occult sciences, the occult disciplines, I find astrology to be one of the most accurate and one of the, it's funny because Peter Carroll kind of said in, in Libra Null that he doesn't recommend astrology. And this is where he and I differ because I think that if you find the right astrological system, it's highly accurate and can definitely be a big, uh, definitely be a, um, a boon to your magical practice if you're able to follow all the transits and, and plan accordingly. Um, but I, I do consider chaos magic to be in a way sort of a, a look at each of the occult sciences and, you know, for what they are, for like their baseline um, underlying structure. And I feel like with astrology, you're really able to do that. So I, I can't wait in the future as I become more of an astrologer to do more work with the stars, more work with the planets, and to arrange my magic more accordingly with the planetary transitions. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that that's I definitely think that astrology is going to be more widely accepted in the future. I see that happening a lot now. Both tarot and astrology are becoming very, very popular. Of course, astrology has always been popular, but I, I think it's being taken far more seriously now than it has been in the past. But what I mean with, with stellar magic, it's uh, really going beyond our planetary system. And yeah. so in this case, really going beyond what is possible uh, with astrology. In my opinion, that's Going true. Really but how would you measure the, that? How the would you deepness? Uh, hmm? But how how would you? How, I mean, how would you? How do you operate that? Uh, there are different kind of approaches, uh, and it's really interesting to 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 see how 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 you could uh, get some access to it. For example, it's not a really new thing, and uh, this is not only uh, limited to the domain of chaos magic. For example, when we look at Kenneth Grant and what he done had uh, done with the new Isis Lodge, even in the 1950s, and because he said he had uh, contact with with a planet which he called New Isis, and it's uh, it's really very far away from our planetary system. It's not incorporated into any uh, conventional astrological system, and so so he had uh, so he already was exploring some kind of connection and some kind of transmission to these realms beyond our planetary system, which for him, he symbolized by this whole new Isis uh, ideas. And also Michael Bird, he also had these ideas with his trans uh, transmission transmission stations, where he wanted to get in contact with, uh, with spirits and with, uh, with uh, intelligences uh, beyond our planetary system. Uh, with uh, coming to connection with with intelligences uh, from the vastness of space, for example. So this is not really a brand new approach. And just to give an example, in Chaos Magic, uh, in in Pete Carroll's last book, The Epoch, he presented uh, a kind of approach to this uh, to this kind of stellar magic, where he was using the the symbology of the Necronomicon mythos of the of the of the great gods from from Lovecraft, and this is also an, a quite interesting approach. And I also worked uh, in this approach also together with Pete Carroll. Uh, we did some 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 of these stellar magic workings. Each of these working lasted uh, one year. And we did this during the days when um, Arcanorium College was still in, uh, online and in function. And there was a group of, of people from all over the world who did this, this stellar magic workings. And for this, uh, just to sum it up very simple, uh, Pete proposed to, to use the, the, the elder gods or the old ones from the, from the Lovecraft uh, uh, mythos uh, in, a, in a very special kind of way. Uh, for example, as kind of representation of meta structures of reality. So, for example, Cthulhu was a kind of symbol for everything which is connected to sentience, to consciousness, to, to thinking and mind. And you could see when you see the, the image of an octopus, yeah, it's a kind of great brain with, a, with neural connections to everywhere, the, the tentacles or something like this. So, uh, 
so approaching the idea of Cthulhu as a kind of representation of everything which has to do with intelligence in this universe and as a kind of meta reality of meta system and on the other hand for example chub nigurat the, the, the black goat the black goat in the woods with a thousand youngs it was a kind of representation for everything which has to do with biology and evolution and everything with life and life enhancement and longevity and uh, genetics and everything which has to do with biology and life all the all the the good things and all the nastiness which has to do with life because life so we have life and we have intelligence and then all some other of these gods were also we used as representatives for um, for other things like uh, Hastur for for the principle of entropy and uh, the, the the transcendental uh, futility of everything in the universe and uh, Jörg Sotot, for example, for space and time, and Azatot for, for the center of chaos itself. Uh, it's it's a matter and energy. And uh, looking, you can see these, these principles, yeah? space and time, matter, energy, entropy, futility of everything, intelligence, and, and, evolu and biology. These are really uh, principle, yeah, principles which are very prominent and which must be present all over the universe in some forms and look at these these ideas uh, these 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 ideas represented through these uh, necronomicon mythos gods uh, yeah it, it's quite an interesting approach and not everybody would agree with it but it's it's really brought some very interesting results because we as humans we are used to to do deal with forms that we could address somehow you know that's why we have we could say that's why we have for example uh, we have uh, gods and spirits because we as social beings are used to communicate, to communicate with each other. And so for us, it's very easy to also communicate with spirits, for example, or with gods, because these are addressable. Uh, it's not like just a kind of energy. Uh, for example, the force of nature, it's not so easy to communicate uh, with the forces of a storm, for example, but it's much more easier for a human to communicate with the god of storm. Yeah. Uh, because we are used to communicate with with, with other persons, and so uh, these ideas I presented before with with the Necronomicon gods, it's the same idea. Yeah, it's we make these these uh, we took these these uh, symbols, these ideas uh, of Cthulhu, of Shubnigurat, and all these other entities to be able to address these meta realities of the universe somehow. And it was quite interesting, uh, the results that we got, uh, the, uh, the transmissions that we received. It's just at the beginning, I would say, and, and it's, uh, but it's a quite interesting approach for everybody who is interested. But it's not the only approach. You could also use some other ideas. For example, uh, in the Mart current, Nema also the, uh, had, had used these same ideas. For example, there was a, an entity called Naton, which is a symbol for, for our future development of, of, our, of the whole humanity together, which is half, half human, half individual, but on the other half, it's already connected with everything else in the universe, with a greater community, community of, 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 of uh, universal beings. So these ideas are still around in the magical communities in some different kind of approaches. And coming back to the to the gods of the Necronomicon, uh, this interested me a lot because, uh, for example, uh, some other approaches tried to put these uh, these entities into, for example, the, the tree of life of the Kabbalah and attributing Cthulhu and and uh, Yogsotot and all the other entity to to spheres of the Kabbalah. But for me, it always felt not really appropriate because I always think these these entities that Lovecraft has described. Uh, are even much more beyond this. Yeah? They are not, could be compared with these uh, human conditions. For example, you can't attribute one of the Necronomicon gods so easily to the sphere of Venus, for example. Uh, you know, it's, it's in, in the, on, the, on the Kabbalistic tree of life. I don't think it fits very well. So you have the Venusian the gods there, yeah? from different kinds of pantheons on, on, on planet Earth. They fit very well, but to put some of these these um, major uh, necronomicon gods there it always fitted not very well for me because for me is there are there always representation of something beyond human somehow maybe we are part of it but not uh, in the other way around
So it's a quite an interesting field and uh, to look uh, at this uh, in a way how chaos magic could be used uh, to, to reach these, these, uh, these further dimensions and these, these, uh, these, all these vast amount of information and knowledge that could be accessed uh, through the uh, through these kind of ways, which uh, this must be around somewhere in the universe. I'm pretty sure about that. There must be any answer that uh, you are looking for could be could be find somewhere in the universe. And uh, the best thing uh, and the easiest thing that could be transmitted uh, everywhere without distance, without any, without any time and space limitation, is basically information. So, yeah, that's exactly correct. And and if you know what they're discovering about quantum entanglement <clears throat> and and the ability to transfer information instantaneously through quantum entanglement at great distances this is a reality that's coming to fruition now you know and if there's civilizations out there that are hundreds or thousands of years beyond us then they've probably mastered this it's probably no big deal to them to to transmit information from here and there so many interesting things in what you just said um so i want to respond to a couple of them uh, number one this goes back many years and it's funny you reminded me of it. My first experiment with chaos magic out from out of um, Levian uh, ritual magic into chaos magic was working with Cthulhu as an, as an egregor, as a thought form, you working with Cthulhu. And I envisioned him as this sort of cosmic dream weaver, um, you know, sort of guiding manifestation. As I, I turned him into this sort of all purpose God and tried to manifest through this medium and it worked. I had a lot of success with it. And I th that was so mind blowing to me because here's a, a character that I know to be fictional, right? But I'm able to use them as a thought form or a Gregor and, and actually have magical success through it. It really yeah. showed me the power of my own mind and the connection you have the universe. It, it, it proved to me that the universe doesn't care what you call it. It's real and it's there. It doesn't care if you want to call it Cthulhu or any of these other God form names, right? You're just forming your connection yeah. to the chaos realm. Now, when you're talking about the Necronomicon, that reminded me of another author who I'd like to have on this show, uh, Joshua Free, who wrote an alternate version of the Necronomicon. Uh, and, and it's not, so the, the version of the Necronomicon that we're all familiar with by Peter Lavenda is essentially a work of fiction, uh, but it's, you know, it's a work of fiction intermixed with real Sumerian magic uh, inscriptions and rites and, and ideas like Anu and Enki and Enlil and the, the Sumerian gods are all represented in this book with accurate descriptions from the Sumerian tablets, but it's interwoven with uh, the Lovecraftian stuff. So there's this, let's see if I have it here. Uh, this version, it's nothing to show, of the Necronomicon written by Joshua Free and also titled the Anunnaki Bible is a complete system of magic uh, called Mardukite magic that works with the Anunnaki gods of the ancient Sumerian civilization, which, you know, it, depending on your interpretation, if you want to go with the Stitchin interpretation or, you know, these guys who, who are adamantly against Stitchin, uh, but in this version, we're going with the Stitchin interpretation that these are, you know, cosmic beings flesh and blood cosmic beings that are out there in the depths of space and through them we can work magic and i think that that's incredibly cool super powerful um and i haven't I've, i haven't dug into this book yet i've owned it for quite a while it's just kind of at the back of my reading list but i, I do want to get into it and see what what magic and what kind of contact can be formed with these cosmic entities because they got to be out there <laughs> yeah yeah definitely yeah there must be something there yeah yeah, it's just it's so difficult because we, I don't feel like in our own in our lifetime we're going to get that, you know, proof is such an abstract anyway, you can't really prove anything, but we all kind of want that sort of physical evidence of these types of interactions with the, you know, we're not going to get that. So we have to develop faith in our ability to make these connections, right? Like I said, when I listen to channeled messages, I don't doubt the information in the message I, I question like it, where is it necessarily coming from i really want to know um but I, I do definitely believe that it's possible to make contact with consciousnesses that could be you know vast distances away i, I just don't see why not and there are many people in the world who claim to be doing it now and some of them with very compelling stories have you ever had yeah, it's, any, uh, any quite some time like around here yeah, these ideas and 
this interest in these in these areas. Uh, uh, for example, in, in, in former times, uh, people had some some religious visions. Yeah, it was very common uh, that they had uh, religious visions, uh, seeing the, the the Virgin Mary and stuff like this. And uh, but I have the impression that that this is not so so very much uh, around here anymore, like in times before. Nowadays, people are seeing UFOs and having strange encounters of the third kind, and uh, it's it maybe has changed into this direction. I think Robert Anson Wilson also mentions this in one of his books, even several decades ago. He said, "Yeah, there's now a change of." Of, of the of the yeah of the map again yeah of the map of the territory it's not a religious map which is uh, symbolized by uh, religious visions and it's more now a kind of te technolog technological map or scientific map, map where you can find uh, UFOs and other of, of these ideas uh, yeah it's interesting and uh, we all know that uh, how how the imaginations and the fantasies of humankind uh, which were presented in literature and nowadays in, in, in the movie culture and everywhere, uh, how they, they come very easily into being into a reality. Uh, for example, when we are looking at some of these uh, technolo technological inventions, yeah, when I remember uh, in my youth, I, I was used to have a telephone with a, where I have to dial uh, 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 the numbers yeah i don't have uh, any any buttons there i have to dial it yeah I have, a, a, and uh, then we saw at uh, at, uh, at these uh, star trek um, episodes we saw that they have these portable communication devices yeah and where we still have had, had an old telephone which was connected by a cable yeah, to us to to a static thing yeah and we were not able to carry it around wherever we want yeah? and only a few years later, everybody was walking around with 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 uh, mobile phones, and nowadays our our mobile phones they could do so much more things than these uh, communication devices from Star Trek in the early days. Yeah, now we can surf the internet, we could do films there, we could record something, we could do nearly everything. Yeah, we have our portable computers here, which is much more powerful than maybe the, the whole um, uh, computer of of the former Star Trek universes. Yeah, and this happened only in a very very, very short amount of time. And when we look at all these science fiction ideas, these fantasy ideas about uh, communication with outer space and with, uh, with uh, the inhabitants of, of the vastness of the universe. And uh, yeah, maybe we could, we will be able to, to see this in reality, yeah? because always these ideas of these visionaries uh, pred may predict parts of the future somehow. So maybe we have good chances to to get into some interesting contact with some some other intelligences from from outer space in the near future. I hope so. I hope so too. And I, I think that you're right. Technology has advanced so rapidly. I'm only 37, and actually, when I was growing up, we had a rotary phone in my house as well. Um, <clears throat> and I mean, I remember the birth of the internet. I remember mm -hmm. the birth of cell phones and and now I have a cell phone that I'm using to record this podcast that has the internet that is wireless in every way, you know, and I can talk to my friends in other countries. It's it's yeah, it's really outrageous how incredible our technology is. And it's really wireless technology has gone a long way in my mind at least to demonstrate how, you know, we we're able through technology to create things that seem like magic. Cell phones seem like magic. We don't think of them as magic, but you know, one out of 50 people, or I'm sorry, 49 out of 50 people do not know how their cell phone works. No idea. It's just, it's like magic, you know? And so it, it kind of opens the doors in your mind to, well, maybe some things are possible that we totally thought were impossible because 20 years ago, you could have, if you could time travel back 20 years and say, guess what? No one would believe you <laughs> yeah. in terms of what we're, what we have now. It just just 20 years ago, we were still dial up internet and the internet was like not even a, really a big deal. It's just kind of yeah. this new th whatever thing. Just imagine you would be able to show a person uh, 20 years ago what your current uh, mobile phone could could be could could be doing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they won't believe you. Yeah. Somehow. No, no way. That would be, seem like total science fiction. Yeah. Say, what? In, in 20 years? No, never. Yeah. You must come from a much further period in time. <laughs> yeah. 
All right. Well, anyways, Hagen, that seems like a great place to wrap it up. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, it's been super yep. fun. I think we covered a lot of ground here. Uh, I always really enjoy going off on on tangents about the paranormal and aliens and, and magic. This is this is what I live for. So thank you so much for uh, being here and for doing the show. Yeah, thank you for so much for inviting me and uh, that I was able to to have a nice chat with you this evening. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much, man. I'll talk to you later. Okay.